So our first speaker of this session will be Joe Rennes, who will be talking about belief propagation decoding of quantum channels by passing quantum messages. So yes, uh, thanks Todd for introduction and uh, I'm excited to be here to tell you about belief propagation decoding. I guess there's a little bit of competition with the other talk or maybe not everyone has realized that we've started. Um, I'm also excited to be, this is coming back home for me because um, here we have a nice picture of Seattle looking to the west to the Olympic, uh, Olympic Mountains and on the Olympic Peninsula, this is where I grew up, so we'll see a few more pictures of this throughout the talk. Um, so what I'm going to tell you about today is in this archive preprint here, so you can check that out also. Okay, so some time ago, I, perhaps a long time ago, I won't say how long, I heard a nice talk from Ben Schumacher about his research in quantum information theory, and he was talking about what does it mean to do research in quantum information theory in general, and his basic comment was, well, you take a, your favorite uh, text on classical information theory, open to a chapter, and translate the results or the contents into quantum mechanical language. All right, well, we can try that. Here's a book on classical information theory. It's Modern Coding Theory by Tom Richardson and Rudiger Abanki. So if you were at QIP last year, you recognize Rudiger gave a talk on all the latest and greatest that's happened in modern coding theory since they published this book. But the main point of the book is, is that, or one of the big tools in, in modern coding theory is what's called belief propagation decoding. And it's, there's actually not one chapter to look at here for that, but, but many. Um, and some of you are perhaps actually making use of this belief propagation decoding right now. Um, I, I'm certain that not everyone is listening to the talk that carefully. You might be checking something on your wireless. And latest Wi-Fi standards um, have the possibility of using codes that, that use belief propagation decoding. One thing you could do with it is download this paper, for instance. Um, <laughs> OK. It's not just uh, a tool that is useful uh, you know, because that's the best that we can do. Uh, it actually can achieve capacity, belief propagation decoding, for certain ensembles. And that was one of the things that Rudiger talked about last year. That's a big breakthrough in classical information processing, that so-called spatially coupled low density parity check codes can achieve capacity under belief propagation decoding. OK, so going back to um, this, this observation from Schumacher, the question is, well, is there quantum belief propagation decoding? Okay, so let me tell you just a very vague overview of what belief propagation is. Um, so it's a message passing algorithm. Okay, I'll say what that is in a second. So anyway, it's an algorithm per for performing inference in a graphical model. Okay, so what's this inference part? So in, in noisy channel coding, the task of the decoder is, is one of inference because the decoder sees the output, the channel output, and he knows that it was one of the code words at the input but needs to infer which one. And there's a statistical model for the input and the output, and so you want to do a statistical inference. And the code itself, the code constraints, can be described by a graphical model. Here's, uh, here's one for a 20-bit code of rate 1 half. It's a linear code. It has 10 linear constraints that are represented here. So there's 10 different constraints on the code words. And all the, each constraint, there's a, there's a line to the, the various variables that are involved in the constraint, and the sum of all the variables that are connected have to be zero. Okay, that's the, that's the constraint. Now, belief propagation is far, far bigger than just for decoding. Uh, it's used in a lot, I mean, in, in uh, statistics and machine learning can, can do a lot of different things. Here, for instance, here's a, uh, a graphical model that you might see in image processing. And this belief propagation algorithm is somehow, it uses this um, graphical model here, and there's some sort of message passing on the nodes of the model. I'm not going to describe that now, um, which carries out this inference. Okay, so it, so like I said, it has very wide application. Actually, an early precursor is the beta Pyrrhal's approximation in statistical physics, and it has um, it can beyond inference, it's also useful for optimization and constraint satisfaction. So it's a it's a big tool in in statistics and machine learning. OK, so back to our question, quantum belief propagation decoding. Can we use, yeah, how can we, can we do this, OK? 
Actually, the first thing to realize is that for stabilizer decoding, you can use the classical algorithm. So the stabilizer decoding that you're probably familiar with, um, what you care about there is bit flips and phase flip errors. And already the classical belief propagation algorithm can do this. So the point is that there's a probability distribution for the patterns, the different patterns of bit and phase errors. And you want to do inference on this probability distribution. And so the classical, classical algorithm will do this. It's actually optimal for poly channels. Here's poly. So here's my little picture of a channel. The input is here, obviously. And this sort of rough line means it's quantum. And there's the output. It's, so it's optimal for poly channels and for the erasure channel, this stabilizer decoding. So you can use the classical algorithm for that. But it's not optimal beyond this. Where So in these cases, you can basically work in this bit and phase flip picture, and that's sufficient. Um, but for other channels like amplitude damping, it doesn't, it's not optimal. It's not optimal in the sense that you couldn't achieve capacity this way. And uh, if you don't care about capacity, you just have a finite size code and you want to know about the maximum, say, fidelity that you could, you could uh, s transmit quantum information, it wouldn't be optimal for that either. Okay, so here's my little, this is supposed to be damp. Okay, anyway, that didn't work very well. Okay, so let's, if we want to make a quantum belief propagation decoder, and we're following the Schumacher kind of thing where we just translate into the quantum language, the simplest thing to do is consider not the problem of quantum information transmission right away, but classical information transmission, because it's more like the, the classical case. So if we just consider a CQ channel for simplicity. So here's a CQ channel, it has classical input, which is obviously classical now because it's sort of digital or something. Anyway, and the, but the output is um, quantum. All right, so this is often called W. In the classical, <clears throat> sorry, in the classical world, channels are usually W for whatever reason. Okay. Um, so what we want to do, just I mean, from a very high level, we need to infer the channel input from the quantum output, right? So we need to build this box, upside down W, um, which takes the quantum output and spits out something classical, and I mean. This is the task of the decoding. I mean, this, this, this guy here is the decoder. And um, I'll skip that for a second. Um, right, so we need this decoder. Now, the point is, of course, since it does this, it's a measurement. So it's, ups, it's not just upside down w, it's m, right? It's a measurement. OK, so the point here is that we need to build this measurement. And I need to make an important distinction, because if you know anything about belief propagation already, uh, it's, you might think, oh, well, the, problem is, the quantum problem is going to be very similar to the classical one. But actually, there's a, there's a twist that what you need to do in the, in the classical problem is going to be somewhat different than what um, you need to do in the quantum case. So what I'm trying to stress here is that you need to construct this measurement. And in the classical case, you, it's not that you really need to construct a measurement. You're just doing this inference. And the inference will come down to computing marginals of certain probability distributions. But, and then the, so for the quantum case, it's not enough to compute these marginals. All right. So this will become more concrete later, but I need to make this distinction clear or make it important, uh, highlight it now. Okay. All right. Let me give you some the results of the paper, just so that if the rest of the talk goes totally off the rails, then at least you have something. Um, so we can find a belief propagation decoder for a specific CQ channel which just outputs pure states. And, um, and for a specific class of codes called tree codes, they're just this, factor, uh, this uh, graphical representation turns out to be a tree. Now, interestingly, it, this also works for polar codes. Well, this thing is pretty weak. Um, so we'll get a, a means, for instance, for a capacity achieving decoder for a, no, a lossy bosonic channel for a certain kind of encoding, where you just use two coherent states. And maybe more interestingly, you can um, use it as part of a decoder for sending quantum, quantum information over amplitude damping channel. So there, the idea is the polar coder is, is actually built, the quantum polar coder is built out of things that you might use in this classical quantum problem. Uh, and we can recycle this pure state decoder for amplitude damping, OK? And so we end up with an efficient capacity achieving decoder for amplitude damping. OK, great. So here's a little outline of the rest of the talk. 
So a nice picture of the, the Olympics. Um, first, coding setup, just so they're all on the same page about what the problem is. Uh, the graphical models, which are called factor graphs in this case, and then a little bit about how classical belief propagation works. And in a kind of strange um, presentation, it won't look like what you would see in Richardson or Banke, actually. Uh, but it's adapted for what's going to come later, the quantum belief propagation. And then the most important part is the many open questions, I think. So I think this belief propagation, because it's so useful in the classical, um, classical information processing and machine learning, you can try to figure out how to do quantum things with it or, uh, and so on. And so the decoding problem is one of them, but there's you know, many other applications you could think about, and hopefully this will spur some, some interest in that. And I have a lot of open questions about just the decoder, and that will maybe motivate you to solve all these problems. OK, so here's our coding setup. It's the usual Shannon scenario. It's very serious. Uh, it's a very serious affair. So we have stochastic IID noise. We're not considering the adversarial case. We don't care about adversarial errors. And we're not worried about errors in the decoder. We're not trying to do fault tolerance, uh, fault tolerant decoding. So if, whoops. <laughs> give everything away. Um, so this is the usual picture. You have a message. You want to encode it. And then it goes over many instances of the channel, which is describing the noise. Okay. And we need to build this decoder. We want the encoder and decoder. I mean, we want a high rate code. We want low error probability. But we also don't want to weigh the age of the universe in order for the decoder to output the message. So we need some kind of efficient decoding. So we're going to use linear codes at the, at the encoder. So as I said, that can be described in this graphical way. We'll actually get to a little bit more in a moment. Um, and importantly, now, for belief propagation, the kind of decoding we're doing is bitwise. So what we're going to try to do is uh, we know that at the input, let's say we take, we're interested in the average performance. So take a random code word. And then um, with the assumption that you had a random code word, try to decode the first bit. Like, what was the value of the, the first input, given that you have all of the outputs of the channel? And maybe what's the value of the second one? And just do each one of them independently. And then those are your guesses for the bits of the, the input. And then hopefully that's a code word. And then once you have that guess, you can recover what the message is. So if you want to do bitwise decoding, what you need to do is the classical problem is just to marginalize the joint distribution. There's a joint distribution describing you have a random code word at the input. You have the output. Actually, the decoder gets to see the exact value, right? So there's some. In principle, there's the joint distribution of inputs and outputs. x1 to n is the input. y is the output. You get to see the output, so the, the, the y is fixed. And you just want to know what's the probability of, say, xi and all of these guys. So I just want to marginalize the distribution. Now, the quantum problem is different. It's not about marginalizing anything, because what's happening is you know, for the two, let's say we take the binary case, which we're going to do, there's two possible values, say, for the, the, the bit of, the, say, the second, second bit in the code word right here. And given the fact that the rest of the bits are in a random code word state, that leads to two possible quantum states at the output. There's just two possible quantum states at the output. So we need to perform the Hellstrom measurement. There's no mystery about it. That's what the optimal decoder is going to do if you're doing bitwise decoding. The question is how to do the Hellstrom measurement. Okay, But the important thing also to realize that the classical problem, it's enough to marginalize this joint distribution, of course, because you get to see exactly just fix the value. The analogous problem to this, which has been studied, is to say, OK, I have a density matrix which describes the input and the output, and I want to marginalize the density matrix. That's not what we're doing here. That has been done before. It's called quantum belief propagation. It's been done. David Poulin has, has studied this, Matt Liefer, Matt Hastings. This is a totally different algorithm. So it has the same sort of name, but uh, it's important to make the distinction. In the context I'm talking about here, I would call this thing density matrix belief propagation to make a distinction. OK. So now our linear codes are, uh, have nice factorized properties. So let's just consider uh, an arbitrary distribution, P, a probability distribution. We have four variables, say. And suppose it factorizes in this way. We can describe this here with this graph. So here are the variables, and here's the different factors, and you connect the variables to the factors if, you know, if they show up in the function. 
And the point is, when you have a factorized probability distribution, it's easier to marginalize, easier to compute the marginals. So computing the marginals is a hard task because it's, it takes forever to loop through all the possible states of the other variables that you don't care about. But if there's some factorization, then this can be easier. So here you save by being able to um, compute the, get rid of three and four by looking only at h, and then worry about two altogether with, with the rest of them, x2. Um, OK, so, and it's just the distributive law. You're not, it's not magic here. You're just using the distributive law, but it's making it a little bit easier to compute the marginals. Now, the coding setup is always has this nice factorized form. OK, so here's the, say, the joint distribution of inputs and outputs for the classical case. Because the channel is um, acting IID, there's always just one factor of the channel transition probabilities for each input. So that shows up here. And then there's the code word constraints. But we have this linear code, so those factorize as well. I didn't write the factors here, but they're, they're written over here. OK, so there's a joint input and output distribution. So here I should have, I mean, this is the graph. This is a graph for, for a, a coding scenario. I didn't write the y variable nodes. The variable nodes are round nodes. The factor, uh, I mean, the yeah, factor nodes are square. But I didn't write the y ones because those are fixed at the channel output. So you can just consider them to be part of the, um, the factor node for the channel itself. OK. So it always has this factorized form. Now, classical, classical belief propagation decoding, how does it work? OK, so um, let's consider the case, again, a binary input channel. And the first thing to realize is, in this case, you only care about the likelihood of the two, um, the likelihood ratio given the output. So it doesn't matter what the output alphabet is or anything like that. You get to see the exact value of the channel output. So all you care about is the relative probability of 0 versus 1. So this is all you need to describe the action of the channel. So in other words, the likelihood is a sufficient statistic for the statistics of the channel. OK, so we're going to work. We're going to use the likelihoods. All right, so let's come back to our problem. Say we have this particular, whoops, this particular um, graph. Now, if we're interested in decoding x1, then we can think of you know, x2, x3, x4. These are in a random code word state. But basically, say x1 to y1 to n to the outputs is sort of a channel. And what we want is the likelihood for this channel. Okay? That's what we need to compute. Okay, so let's assume that the factor graph here is a tree. So in fact, this one is a tree. Surprise, I <laughs> picked this example. So the tree just means, of course, there's only one path between each, any two nodes, so we can pick um, in this case, I picked x1 as the root, but you can pick anything as the root. Now, the way classical belief propagation works, one way to think about it, this is not perhaps the standard way, but basically for each node in the graph, you can associate a channel from that node to all of the le its leaves, all of the things that it could eventually lead to at the, at the, at the leaf. Okay? And then what the algorithm does is recursively compute the likelihood that you want starting from the leaves. OK, so let's, what do I mean exactly? So, OK, so for each node, there's a channel to the leaves. Now, the ones at the leaf, those are just the physical channels. OK, so that you already know the likelihood for it. That's the actual physical channel. OK, there's also the channel from, say, x3 to the leaf, x4 to the leaf, x2. In fact, those are all the same as the ones before. but there's some likelihood for, for this channel, and there's some likelihood for this channel. And what belief propagation is going to do is combine those two likelihoods in a certain way to get the likelihood for the channel from this node to the leaves. To the leaves. And then finally go to the root, right? OK, so there's, there's basically two rules that belief propagation has. There's one rule for combining likelihoods when the, um, the branch point here is a, is a this check node or when it's a variable node. So here at the root, there's three uh, branches coming out. So these, the likelihoods of these three channels need to be combined in a certain way. And here there's one, it's a check node. The likelihoods of these two channels need to be combined in a different way. OK, so like I said, the belief propagation is basically the rules for these two combinations of likelihoods. 
And you can think of them as, as two kinds of channel convolution. Okay, so when you combine the likelihoods of, say, W and W prime, according to belief propagation rules, you get a new likelihood. But you could say, well, that's the likelihood of a different channel, the, the convolution of the two channels that just define that to be the convolution um, operation. And so, and the rules are, are this, actually. So in, encoded in this table are the rules for combining likelihoods in, uh, for belief propagation, but it's just in terms of the channel convolution itself. So at the variable node, that's the round convolution. Say you have two channels, W, W prime, you want to combine. Well, what is the effective channel that goes from the variable node to two, down two branches? If, if the two branches are W and W prime, then the channel from the variable node itself, if there's a zero input to that channel, then it outputs this thing. If there's a one, it outputs this one. So it just, it's just a little repetition code where the effective channel at the variable node is just whatever input it gets, it just gives those inputs to the two descendants. Okay, so you get, the, you get both outputs um, from each of the two channels. Okay, so here W0 means the output you get when you put in zero, and W1 is the output you get when you input W1. So for this audience, you should just think of those as the density matrices that come out of the channel. Um, now the check convolution is more complicated. It doesn't, doesn't give you this nice repetition. What it does is the input to the check convolution channel is basically controlling the parity of the two outputs. So you see here you get, um, if it's a zero coming into the check node, um, the effective channel is saying, well, the output is either this guy with two zeros, two zero inputs to the two subchannels, or both one. So that's the even parity case. And then the other one, if it's a one, it, you flip it to odd parity. So that's a little bit more complicated, but that's the check node convolution. Okay, so those are the two. Um, so very cleverly, the, the notation is chosen so that this convolution is, corresponds to the round nodes and so on. Okay. Now it turns out that these rules um, will find the exact marginal if the factor graph is a tree. Okay. And you can run the algorithm concurrently basically for all the code word bits. It's not a big overhead to do that. So what I've been describing so far, you're only interested in a particular bit by itself, but you can basically run it all uh, in parallel. And most importantly for applications to actual codes is that it works on loopy graphs uh, for low density parity check codes that you might be interested in. So the tree, it's great that belief propagation works exactly on a tree, but tree codes aren't very good actually. Uh, nevertheless, these low density parity check codes that are implementable, um, they're not trees, they have loops in them, but the loops are you know, tame enough such that the algorithm sort of still gives a reasonable answer. So what you do there is you basically um, run the algorithm until it kind of converges and hope that it gives the right result. I won't go into too much details on the loopy case, but it's important to realize that the tree case is not the useful case for practice, in practice, okay. Okay, so let's take a small, we need a little break. We did classical belief propagation. You see where we've been, see where we're going. We want to talk about the quantum case now. All right. Okay, now we want to build the quantum belief propagation decoder. Okay, so the outputs are of the channel are quantum. There's no likelihood function anymore. That doesn't make sense. Um, and we want to perform the Hellstrom measurement. So our goal is slightly different. We don't get to just see that, you know, we can't condition on the channel output. That doesn't mean anything in the quantum case. So, okay, this is what, this is what we have. Now the leaves are spitting out quantum states, basically. But otherwise, it's the same graph. Okay, so the goal, I mean, the question now is, what we did in the classical case uh, was somehow combine the likelihood information so that we could make the decision for the decoding problem. Is there some way to repackage the outputs of the quantum channels at the leaves here um, like we did for likelihood? Or another way of thinking about it that's probably maybe better is, well, we want to make the Hellstrom measurement that goes with the channel from x1, say, to the leaves. And suppose we know how to do the, the Hellstrom measurement for this node to the, to the leaf, and for this one to its leaves, and this one, well, this is just the channel. So if we knew how to do those Hellstrom measurements, if we knew exactly what they were, 
how would we combine them to make the Hellstrom measurement for the channel from the root? Okay. So we need some, some way of constructing the Hellstrom measurement for you know, the convolved channels from the Hellstrom measurements of the, the two inputs. If we can do that, then we can build up the decoder. Okay, so let's try the simplest possible case. Classical inputs, that looks like the classical problem. We'll just take we'll do two classical inputs, and we'll take two outputs, which are pure states. So we might as well take them to be qubits. Let's say their overlap is cosine theta, and we'll, um, just, just to fix it, we'll say that they're oriented so that the optimal measurement to decide between them is the sigma x measurement. Okay. So this is, the, this is the simplest case I could think of. And um, all right, so now we have the ingredients. We have the channel here. We have the factor graph. And this is the rules for belief propagation that we saw from the classical case. So let's see if they will give us anything useful in the quantum case. So the great thing about the pure state channel, so first of all, it, is, it seems like the simplest thing you could, um, you could, you could think about. Um, but you can see from the, the variable node convolution, this is good news because this convolution also gives pure state. So if the two channels you're interested in, W and W prime, have pure state outputs, then so does their variable convolution because it's just going to be this. Okay, so here the channel is such that the output plus goes with zero and minus goes with one. That will be convenient in a moment. So the two possible outputs are just plus theta, plus theta prime, tensor product. Okay, you get two pure states again. So it's a channel of the same kind. So you could repackage that into one single qubit with some unitary. The unitary depends on the angles. Okay. So the angle, is, okay, this is the fine print. So you, the point is, since you get pure state outputs, you can just remap that into a qubit again. So you're back where you started. So the, the, con, the convolved channel is, again, a pure state channel. Now, you can also see that the check node won't be like that because it's a mixture. So that seems like, oh, this is not going to work. So you get stuck for a while, and then you realize, like, oh, there's actually really simple unitary that will transform it basically into a heralded mixture of pure states. The unitary, okay, it happens to be two C naught gates, but it doesn't really matter. What you can do is that the outputs of the check node uh, convolution are two qubits, but it's a classical quantum state. There's one qubit you can measure, and it doesn't disturb it at all. And it tells you it, which sector you're in for the other qubit, which, which sector the other qubit is in. That is, the other qubit is in one of two uh, pure states, and the angle depends on which sector you're in. So the angle is this theta. Um, check convolution, and the value of the angle depends on j, and okay, the outputs are still plus minus. So by measuring this extra qubit, you can, you can figure out which sector you're in, and so you're basically also back to the pure state case. This is the fine print. Okay. So we're almost done now. This is the algorithm for this particular problem. You can run through it. Um, so okay. We're, at the, we're interested in the x1, so we need to do the variable node convolution of these two guys. Um, so these are the qubits, uh, sorry, these, these are the qubits over here. This is the factor graph that goes with it. So there's the qubit that goes with 1. There's the qubit that comes through the channel from 3. So we need to combine those two. But we also need to do this check node convolution of 2 and 4. OK, so let's just reorder the qubits with the swap gate. And then we can do the convolution for the variable node. That's with this unitary here. We need to know the angles that go into this, but OK, we know that. And so at the output, you get one qubit. The other one can be discarded, and it's in this, this new state. Um, on the other side of things, we do the check node convolution. So to combine qubits, the outputs from 2 and 4, and we get this state where, OK, now we need to know, we need to measure which sector we're in, and then we can continue. So once we've done that, so we've combined these two guys, and we have this, this channel here. We need to combine the result at the variable node. Okay, so we, we, have, we have two pure state channels. We can check uh, which sector we're in for this um, check node convolution. Uh, and the variable node convolution is simple, but it needs to know the angles involved, and that you need to feed it in the classical, the classical data to know which, sec which sector you're in. OK, and then you can recombine all the information into one qubit and then perform the Hellstrom measurement on that qubit. So that's the last step here. So that's how you construct the algorithm, the circuit, from the factor graph, basically. So you can do that. 
What's, what's going on is basically you can think of it as sort of message passing where the qubits are being passed around, also some classical bits. These behave like a sufficient statistic for this class of channels. So you can always describe the convolutions and everything for pure state channels with some angles and some classical bits, just like it's kind of like the likelihood ratio. Um, so in this case, we're going to have to decode all the code word bits sequentially because, OK, we'll have to run this for x1 and then reverse it, make the measurement here, and then reverse it all, and then run it for x2 and reverse it and run it for x3. So in the end, you get an order n squared implementation of all of the Hellstrom measurements. OK, I don't think you really have time to talk about the polar coding case. Let me skip this. Um, but this is how you can build the polar decoder for it. And you would get this uh, order n squared decoder for the amplitude damping case. OK, so the open questions in the last uh, three seconds. Um, all right, so this was the algorithm for one specific channel. What about other channels? <laughs> what if we tried to do classical coding for the amplitude damping channel, for instance? Not quantum. The previous slide was about quantum communication. OK, what about loops? I said a couple of times that um, the tree case is, is good in theory, but in, for high rate codes, that's not going to be the interesting case. So as I said, the, the spatially coupled ensemble can achieve capacity. Could you, could you achieve capacity for the CQ pure state case? So there's going to be loops in the factor graph. How do you even run it in that case? Maybe we can use the density matrix belief propagation, the classical, just marginalize the, the, um, the density matrix for the description of the problem and then use this to build the Hellstrom measurement somehow. It's not really clear to me. Um, for this, you need to have some maybe sufficient statistics come out of this. And OK, when you, when you run this loopy case, you're not getting a global tree. But locally, it will look like a tree. So how do we turn the local tree into a global tree? Maybe we can use some tensor network methods here. Um, clearly, the factor graph is a graphical method. Uh, it has some relation to tensor network, but I don't know what it is. Um, now, in the classical case, there are many approximate algorithms for uh, belief propagation. One of them is junction tree, which is basically just glom all the nodes together until you make a tree. And maybe something like that could work here, but I don't know. Um, so we were doing bitwise decoding. Another thing that you might do in the classical, classical case is blockwise decoding, which is called Viterbi decoding. Try it. I don't, this is also unknown. Um, okay, we could try to have a fully quantum version. And I think the biggest open question is, what about all these other tasks? So this is just one tiny example of a quantum belief propagation where it's really a quantum algorithm. Um, but what about for constraint satisfaction or for um, optimization or other inference tasks? Can we you know, expand this to, to different cases? OK, so thanks for your attention. OK, we have time for a few questions. So right here. That's really bright. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, I, w I was wondering whether um, disturbance by this Hellstrom measurement plays a role in when considering uh, bitwise versus blockwise decoding. Yeah, so you have to do something like, I mean, the statement is kind of like what Aaron was talking about yesterday. You're going to do the sequential measurements. You just look what the error is that when you, when you do that, and you use some union bound to um, a non-commutative union bound to, to bound the errors. So it's only going to be good when all the bitwise decoders are good, OK? Um, but in the polar case, that's, that's guaranteed. Have you thought about analogies to these techniques for maximum entropy inference rather than maximum likelihood? Well, the short answer to that is no, because I don't know what maximum entropy inference is. Um, it's I think it sounds like it would be. Distribution and then use your known error rate to uh, try to infer what state you got. Sorry, can you say that again? It's where you're taking a thermal distribution to account hmm. for your uh, somewhat known error rate. Oh, I see. Um, <laughs> OK, so I, I, it sounds like it very be, would be very useful to do, but I don't know off the top of my head anything about it. There's Mark over there in the corner. OK. 
For the, for the case of the optical channel, the lost channel, have you thought about how you could actually implement these unitaries? You, right. OK, so for the pure loss case, you can see that the decoder would be efficient in the number of gates you need. But it's, it's still yet another matter to see how you would do the gates. Uh, no, I haven't thought about that. I suspect it's very difficult to do them with linear optics, say or something like that. But I haven't thought about that at all. I think, so the first step is to see, like, OK, we don't need to do an infinite number of things. And then yeah, someone who's actually also more knowledgeable about how to actually implement certain gates needs to look at that. Because I could try it, but I think it will take me too long. Other questions? All right, then let's uh, thank Joe again.